Since the fall of man, a war has raged between good and evil. Over the centuries, this war has distorted the truth. Now the truth is perceived as lies, and lies acknowledged as truth. To this day, the battle continues as we investigate and debate the truth behind the history and mystery of the universe. We are Paratruth Radio. People often see our current world as a dark time in history, one in which evil is at its greatest. Yet the book of Genesis tells us of another time, one that was even more wicked and treacherous than it is now, one in which there was so much evil that the Lord destroyed the earth with a flood. Jesus later tells us that such a time will come again and that the world will become so evil that the Lord will be forced to destroy it again. Now Paratree presents, as it was in the days of Noah, with special guest, Jeff Kinley. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Eric. I'm Justin. And you are listening to Paratruth Radio. What's going on, man? Uh... I, I plead the fifth. Uh... For what? <laughs> mean that, meaning there's not much going on. I see. I see. Same old, same old. How about you? Uh, uh, it's getting it's getting busy, man. It's getting crazy with the movie and everything and trying to get stuff set up. And, uh, you know, this is my last week of work here yeah. for the summer. So I'm just trying to get everything organized and ready to go. Yeah, I but be, I bet yeah. it's going to be a... Uh, a uh, Real nice transition back into school again. I hope so. We'll see. I've got a lot of work when I get down there. But until then, we've got an awesome episode of Paratruth Radio to get through. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, if you weren't interested before the intro of the show, then you should be interested now because we are going to have an awesome discussion with Jeff Kinley, who wrote the book as it was in the days of Noah. A book that compares our current times and even the future time of this earth with that of the earth in the book of Genesis. So without further ado, why don't we go to the line with our special guest, Jeff Kinley. All right, Jeff, welcome to the show. Great to be with you tonight. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing fantastic. It's hot down here in Arkansas, but uh, we're uh, we're faring pretty well. Great, that's that's good. Uh, it's getting pretty warm up here in Cleveland as well. I was we, say pretty much everywhere. We're yeah. we're getting hit too. <laughs> it's been kind of a cold summer Absolutely. for us. So. so this book, as it was in the days of Noah, it's a very interesting title to say the least. Uh, one personally for me that just really piques my interest. Just what exactly gave you the idea to name the book? this way well right before i guess it was probably about uh, nine months before the um the noah movie came out with russell crowe uh they were doing some uh, some private screenings and my literary agent was actually at one of those screenings and the scenes that they showed him were, were very um uh compelling and so he said uh, he said you know what he said I haven't seen the rest of the movie, but, you know, as Hollywood often does, they twist the story and they get a lot of the facts wrong as they're recorded in the Bible. So mm-hmm. he says, you know, someone needs to write a book immediately called As It Was in the Days of Noah and just not only set the record straight, but also uh, sort of springboard off of Jesus' words in Matthew twenty four thirty seven, where he said that the last days will be just as it was in the days of Noah. Mm-hmm. And so to make a long story short, we just got right on it. And, um, and I basically locked myself in a room for about six weeks and uh, did the research and cranked this book out in, in record time and, and got it out so that it could be released uh, during the time of, of the movie's release. And, of course, what we found out was is that though there were a lot of great 
cinematography in the movie, the movie just completely missed the whole um, gist of Noah and who he was and what he did. And so it was really sort of a timely uh, book. Um, didn't kind of set out to capitalize on anything like this, but it just turned out to where there's been really a resurgence of this whole story of Noah. In fact, what's crazy, guys, is that at no time since the actual days of Noah has Noah been so in the news and been so popular. And mm -hmm. so I really believe that God has really brought this to the forefront of our consciousness for such a time as this. So that's really kind of what was behind the impetus in writing the book. Okay. Well, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Most people know the the story of Noah, but they don't know all the stuff behind what happened, why the flood came, and why Noah had to do what he had to do. And I've, I've all heard numerous people say the movie was was not even close to what <laughs> the Bible story really is. And, right. uh, you know, I never watched it for a very specific reason. I know the story, so to watch the movie and it completely destroys it, for me, it, it would be pointless. Yeah, yeah, and it really did. I mean, it completely ignored other than just a couple of, of key points uh, in the story of Noah. But, but to your question, I mean, it's really interesting because you know, as we look back at the days of Noah, we see things there that we kind of scratch our head and we read the Bible and go, wait a minute, did, did God really just say that? Uh, for mm -hmm. example, in Genesis chapter 6, um, verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So you kind of look at that verse and go, whoa, you mean man was completely depraved and all he was thinking about was evil? Millions, perhaps billions of people are thinking evil thoughts. And and so the very next verse says, and that made God very, very sad, that, and he was sorry that he made man and said he grieved in his heart. And so really the whole beginning of God making this decision to wipe out mankind flowed not really from a, a furious fist, but more from a broken heart. And so mm -hmm. we see this, this pandemic evil that's throughout the earth. And, you know, I guess the, the thing is, is that as mankind becomes uh, more absorbed into his own culture, we sort of turn our heads and we see evil, and we don't really react like normal people. Uh, you know, we, we see things that are happening around us, and we just go, oh, okay, well, I guess that's what people do. Um, but in Noah's day, uh, we see lots of things that sort of emerge out of the waters that are characteristic of his generation that I see and that, that many people see paralleling the times in which we are currently living. Oh, I completely agree. And I mean, come from experience, you know, just being a Christian, you know, I feel like I become so immune to some of the way that the world is in regards to sin. And I don't always react the way a Christian should act, you know, in regards to being sad for certain incidents and praying about it and, you know, just weeping over it like the scriptures tell us, like Jesus wept, you know, right. we become so hardened by the way the world is because it's so often and so common, you know, God, God could even see as us not purposely being evil, but in the sense that just our hearts don't break the way they should, you know, yeah. and it's, yeah, it's, it's, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, you just go back even just a generation in our own country, the things that uh, that are happening today that, that we don't even blink at as a culture, the things that we're actually promoting and endorsing and, mm -hmm. and the passing laws about uh, just our parents' generation would have just not – would have thought this was some sort of futuristic, you know, decadent sci-fi movie or something. Right. And yet it's reality, and this is where we're living right now. And so – uh, it's kind of crept up on us uh, in some ways, and but at the same time, you know, we, it's nothing new because we see that in the days of Noah. And in fact, one of the the key issues that we see in the Book of Genesis is just a a, a godlessness that has permeated the entire earth, and they they forgot God; they had no regard for Him. Um, the Book of Jude calls their generation an ungodly generation, and so the spirit of the age is is kind of the idea that God is shoved to the margins globally. Uh, in our day, he's even written out of his own creation story. He can't right. even be the creator anymore. And so the, they systematically just choke the truth about God, about who he is, about his morality, about uh, how he's made us as human beings. And that's really pushed to the edge. And now 
we're being marginalized as believers and we're kind of the crazy ones, uh, you know, that uh, are put on the same level as, as someone who, who thinks that, you know, you know, the moonshot was staged by a Hollywood crew or something. I mean, we're kind of <laughs> put out there on the edge. Right. So um, anyway, it's just kind of the whole idea that that Christians, because they believe in this old archaic tale about the Bible and the flood and that type of thing, um, we're now the people that are ostracized and put on the outward. And that's one of the evidences that we see as we, we look at Noah's generation. Here's a guy, I mean, says he was the only righteous man. So apparently he was greatly outnumbered. And, and I know that if we feel that today as Christians, think about how Noah must have felt when literally the entire world was against him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, going a little, just continuing on with how this the world does seem to be going back to the way the days of Noah. And the fact that, according to statistics that were recently polled, in America alone, Christianity over the past 10 years has decreased significantly. And we're starting to see it all around the world where, at one point, I know I watched this video where Christianity began and they showed a timeline from when it first started, uh, when Christ, you know, started his ministry and progressed all the way till today's time. And it seemed to spread and spread and spread, but then it suddenly halted. And now it's starting to regress. And it's coming back. Right. And it's just amazing at how quickly not only people who are specifically against Christianity are trying their best to push it away, but how people just don't even know one way or the other, completely understand what Christianity is all about. You know, how many people grow up not ever hearing the name Jesus or even hearing about God, period? Well, that's very true. And, and uh, for the past uh, 15 or 20 years, I've done uh, quite a bit of work over in England and some mission work and working with churches over there. And the thing that we found 15 years ago is that we would go into the schools and we would talk to young people who literally had never heard the name of Jesus Christ and had no idea what, what he was about or what he had done for them or anything. And as I just began observing our own culture now with more and more people being unchurched and with uh, secularism really taking over kind of the popular thought in our culture, guys, we have kids growing up today, but they don't have any base knowledge of God or who he is or Jesus. It's just kind of like rumors they've heard about him. And that's more and more true as the uh, the people, the, the amount of people who attend church on a given Sunday, you know, seems to, to continually decline, especially in certain areas of our country. And at the same time, You've got, you know, the church is now beginning to say, wow, you know, how it's like we've been asleep all this time. What do we do mm-hmm. that this this flood has seeped into our own house? And now we don't know how to seal up the borders. We don't know how to make an impact because the darkness seems to be overtaking the light. And so it's really it's happening in culture and it's happening in the church. But uh, and we could talk about this uh, in a little bit later. But I think there's some really great things that are happening in the church as a result of seeing where we are in history and what's going on. I think the church can really have a massive impact uh, during this time, but it might not be in the way that, that most people think. Mm-hmm. Well, I was reading through the book, and I, I came across a lot of stuff that I, I never really knew. And one of those things was that there was so much uh, sexual depravity and uh, different things that are going on um, now, back then, uh, I never knew that because it's, as far as I know, I haven't seen it in the Bible story. So uh, do you feel that a lot, of the, a lot of the history that was happening back then is repeating itself today? Well, here's kind of how the, the, the flow of thought goes. I mean, historically speaking, I mean, any time that you take God, who is, who is the, the ultimate lawgiver, the moral lawgiver, when he is taken out of the picture, then what are we left with? Well, we're left with, you know, man's own desire or own uh, standard of morality, whatever that might be. And, of course, we know that that changes over time, depending on who's in power, who has the best lawyer. Um, but what we see back in Noah's day was that there was an, an unrestrained immorality. In fact, I have a whole um, section of the book called 50, Sa- 50 Shades of Immorality. And so, if you can imagine an entire planet with no moral laws from God, no one's enforcing those moral values, no one's promoting those moral values, and basically, like it says at the end of Judges, every man did what was right 
in his own eyes. It doesn't really take a whole lot of imagination uh, to understand that that was a it was a very decadent, uh, corrupt, and base uh, planet. In fact, he says in chapter six that man had become corrupt, and he uses a Hebrew word there that's a very interesting word. It's the same word that Moses later used in Exodus thirty two seven uh, to describe the sexual orgy that was going on at the base of Mount Sinai while Moses was up uh, receiving the Ten Commandments. And so, you know, we have this this unrestrained uh, sexual immorality. Uh, that's going on where really literally anything is fair game. There's no moral standard. Uh, immorality is, is mainstream and it's global and it's accepted. And uh, and we see that really played out in the New Testament in, in Romans chapter 1 where Paul just describes this cascading morality uh, where it just gets worse and worse and worse. And, you know, were it not in the Bible, I, really, I would have to, you know, think it was, it was a fairy tale, but it even says at the end of Romans 1 that that morality gets so bad that they become haters of God and obviously those who, who promote God's values. But then it says they not only practice such evil, but they celebrate with those and they celebrate the sins of others. And I look at my own day and I just go, my goodness, that's exactly what's going on in our culture. We're, we're not just saying it's okay, you know, to practice immorality. We're celebrating it. We're promoting it. We're making laws about it. Uh, that persecute those who now stand up for biblical morality. And so, yes, I do see that unrestrained immorality. And the crazy thing is, is that historically speaking, there have not been, uh, there has not been a culture that has legalized uh, homosexual marriage, for example. And yet the Jewish scribes at the turn of, of, of the first century Believed, they believed that marriage contracts were written during the days of Noah. And they surmised that that was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of God's patience uh, being used up. And so if that's true, if those Jewish scribes and scholars are, are correct in that, then not since the actual days of Noah have there been legal marriage contracts written for homosexuals. And so that would be another eerie similarity between the two cultures. Not only eerie, that's just amazing to think how much time could have passed and uh, just just to think that this here, you know, what has happened in America recently could be the breaking point, you know, the beginning of the end, if you will, as so many people, yeah. Christians in particular, see it as being. <clears throat> yeah. And I want to be careful to say, I mean, I'm not saying that this, that, that is the, you know, going to be kind of the, the hinge pin on this whole thing. I don't know. But right. I do know this is that at no time in history have we been so welcoming uh, to to the sin. Now, you know, quickly to say we, we love homosexuals and we pray for them and, and we can be friends with them, obviously, and, and you know, have relationships, meaningful relationships with them, but, but it's the, that, that particular sin. And I talk about in the book about how that sin really is different from other sins. I mean, there's mm-hmm. a you, you can steal a paper clip from your office and you can, you can even, you know, cheat on your income tax. But, but guess what? This particular sin is a sin against humanity itself because it goes to the very heart of how God created man and woman. And so we're at that point now where, you know, Isaiah 520 says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And we just completely flipped uh, the value system in our country now that where those who simply say, wow, even nature, even if you believe in evolution, it seems like man goes with woman, you know, always right. and, and it's never mixed. But in our culture, you know, we see that they're completely redefining uh, gender and, and you uh, go to apply for a college nowadays, there's at least anywhere from nine to 20 different choices on what gender you are. So it's a real kind of insanity that happens that, again, is outlined in Romans 1 to where we just spiral down or we don't even know which is up, which is down, which is to the side, what is right or wrong. And that's what sin does. Sin makes us insane in terms of understanding what reality is. Right. And, you know, and I've I've talked with people in the past in regards to a number of uh, situations, and one in particular is that of sex changes. And we think of Jenner, who recently had a sex change. And I've spoken with people who, you know, I've talked to them about people, you know, other Christians going overseas to third world countries and trying to reach out to those communities only to end up being 
you know, persecuted, arrested, beaten, killed even for their faith. And the people I've talked to, and I've told them about this. Now, these aren't Christian people, but I've told them that these people go out there and they get killed for their faith. And they're, all they, their response is, well, they're stupid for going out there. They shouldn't be going out there. That's dumb. It's not worth it to, you know, just claim uh, that you're going out there for God and to allow yourself to be killed for God. And yet someone like Jenner stands up on a stage and they call that person courageous, you know, for doing what they did. They're bold. They're they're great. And everyone's praising them. It's like, should we not be praising the people who go out in a harm's way, whether Christian or non-Christian, you know, even military, right. instead of yeah. praising someone who made some rash decision? Right. And I think what we're experiencing here is, is that really, if you think about just from a historical perspective, even in our country, that's not very old. Um, but we've really been given the pass uh, concerning persecution and uh, opposition to our faith. I mean, there are churches just dotting every corner in our in our country, and, and up into the past few years, I mean, we even had you know God fearing people you know in in government positions, and and just we were being supported from our culture as a whole. But historically speaking, that's not been the case uh, for believers, followers of Jesus Christ. I mean, beginning with the first century, I mean, they were under uh, an oppressive, hostile government that persecuted, arrested, uh, tortured, and even killed them for their faith. And and that's obviously one of the reasons why America began was, was to flee religious persecution. So now, as countries do and as history does to repeat itself, we're now beginning to feel just a little bit of the wind in our face uh, mm-hmm. at the kind of opposition that a culture that is an ungodly, godless culture can give uh, believers. And so that's what we're experiencing right now, and, and that's part of us really, uh, that's one of the reasons why Christians have to be so rooted and grounded in the Word of God, because otherwise we, we tend to react emotionally we don't know what's going on we don't know how to respond we don't know how to stand in the wind because our roots aren't very deep right so that's why a lot of christians i think are struggling uh honestly with what do i do with my culture how do i respond how do i live in light of what's going on because i do feel like they're turning on me and they really are and Mm -hmm. and i believe it's going to get worse as we get closer to uh the last days at the end of the last days so we have to to understand how to strengthen ourselves and to walk as light with light, truth, and love mm-hmm. in a time of great darkness. I completely agree. All right, folks. I think we are going to take our first break here. You're listening to Paratruth Radio, and we're talking to Jeff Kinley about his book, As It Was in the Days of Noah. We will be right back after Eric's random fact of the day. Now, Eric's random fact of the day. Did you know that the name Argentina comes from the Latin word Argentum, which means silver? According to Factslides.com, the original European settlers who named the country Argentina believed that the country was full of silver. This was Eric's random All right, folks, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. And we've been talking to Jeff Kinley about his book, As It Was in the Days of Noah. We went to break uh, talking about how uh, things are kind of, history is is kind of repeating itself right now. And uh, Jeff, uh, one thing that uh, we were talking about during the break is the Nephilim. Uh, One thing that I wanted to ask is, you know, in, in the Bible, one of the reasons God flooded the earth was the Nephilim. And uh, in your opinion, um, do you think that the Nephilim somehow survived the flood? I do not think that they survived the flood. However, there's, there's basically, uh, as you kind of break it down, you, you see in Genesis uh, chapter 6 where it talks about the sons of God, that they, they took the daughters of men because they saw that they were beautiful, they made what they had wives for themselves, and, and then it says that the Nephilim was, was in the land. It's very interesting. There's three basic ideas as people approach that uh, and as to the identity of these sons of God. That the Bible describes them. The first uh, is that some people believe that the, the sons of God simply refers to the line of Seth, 
uh, because as Adam and Eve had Cain, Abel, and Seth, and it says that, that men began to call on the name of the Lord uh, when Seth came along, and, and we even can trace, and I do this in the book, uh, directly from Noah all the way back directly to Seth, and there's a godly lineage, uh, a line of godliness that comes straight from Seth all the way to Noah. So some people think that the, the sons of God is simply the, uh, the line of Seth. The two other views are that that these um, these uh, sons of God were um, actual demons who took on the form of, of human bodies. And uh, I document that in the book because when you look into Genesis chapter 19, when the two angels came into uh, Sodom and Gomorrah to rescue Lot, um, they were... They were men. They were uh, took on the form, and we see that many times in in Scripture, where angels take on the form of men. But specifically speaking, here uh, in these uh, decadent cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, you had men who were consumed with desire uh, to have sex with other men, and so when they saw the angels, they greatly desired to have sex with them. So apparently, they had human bodies that at least in the eyes of the men of Sodom were capable of, of having sexual relations. So so from that standpoint, uh, I believe that the sons of God could be fallen angels who took on the form, and that they, those angels, because of that sin, uh, were later confined to God, uh, by God, into a special prison. Uh, then they'll be released in the last days. Um, but the third view is simply that these were men who were uh, demon possessed, and that they took on uh, took these wives uh, for themselves. Now, here's the here's the crazy thing: regardless of whether they were demon possessed men or whether they were actual demons, which I believe it, it were either one of those two things, the fact that you have a culture that would tolerate that, and that there's a culture of women uh, who would allow that, um, tells me it gives me a picture of the greater decadence of that culture. And so uh, I think there were demon worship going on. There was a lot of satanic activity going on because man just continues to devolve. And we know from Ephesians 4 that Paul says the sin nature does not get better. It only gets worse. It is being corrupted daily. So um, so I think that those uh, sons of God uh, were cohabited with, uh, with human mortal women and uh, perhaps produced this race of giants. Now, in regards to this race of giants, though, uh, and especially in the paranormal community, I think that's a huge topic for just about anybody because they claim to continually find these skulls or even these skeletons of these so-called beings. Do you think these these beings were demonic by nature and had some kind of special powers and abilities uh, that almost seem supernatural? Or are these just simple, you know, giant people you know just some someone who happened to be bigger than the rest and so people worship them as being gods even though they you know had no natural power yeah well the evidence i believe is inconclusive as to which that could be and of course you know you get into speculation about whether or not um these you know the, the fact that they were cohabitating with mortal women and that's the reason why they were of such an enormous size um, but then you also have just in, in the genetic code of humanity, uh, the, the propensity towards with some people to produce, uh, more, you know, giant people. And then we obviously know that that was true, uh, with, um, with Goliath, with David and that type of things mm-hmm. as well. But whether or not there, there is a, uh, a demonic connection or not, I really couldn't say. Uh, that it really kind of, you kind of get off the map a little bit, you know, right. and, and some of that. And so I, I want to be careful just to stick to at least what we think Scripture says. Okay. Well, one little rabbit trail here, and Eric, I don't know if you saw this or not, but I just saw an article that they believe that they found Goliath's head, and they've pieced it all together because of the wound that's on the head, that it is Goliath, and and that David had actually killed a a giant, not just a really tall guy, but a, a being that was much bigger than than what we know today as average man. Did you see that article? Well, I no, I personally haven't seen the article. And in regards to whether or not 
it is Goliath. I mean, coming from just my own personal view, I mean, without knowing the exact dimensions of the stone that David had used and, you know, a number of other things such as the power behind uh, the stone and whatnot. I mean, how many people end up dead because they get hit in the head with something? I mean, how many skulls have been cracked in with a hammer and et cetera, et cetera. So to say right point blank that this is Goliath, I think is a little out there. You know, we, we, we don't have DNA to prove it necessarily, but right. I think, you know, the fact that there's speculation, I mean, I'll give them that. I mean, sure, it's a possibility, but uh, I guess I'm kind of curious as to how far they'll actually take it, you know? Yeah, I agree. Um, so the the one thing that uh, I find interesting about the whole Nephilim uh, aspect of, of the the Bible, as well as a lot of people talking about it nowadays, is a lot of people say that the Nephilim had offspring, and actually those offspring had a bloodline that somehow survived the flood, which I asked you if you believe that or not. But since we're talking about history repeating itself, do you think that is a possibility that say, for example, demons have somehow infiltrated the, the human genome again? Well, it would be difficult to say. I think that, you know, the, the forces that we have working against us in the world today, they're, they're, you know, Scripture identifies three. There's, there's the spirit of the world, mm-hmm. uh, which Romans 12, 2 talks about being conformed to the world, and that's just... That's just the spirit of the age. It's what's in you know in the air, so to speak. It's just what is. There's Satan himself and all of his demonic hosts, and then there's the sin nature. Um, what I do know is that left by ourselves, we would we would, be, we would become pretty corrupt all by ourselves mm-hmm. without any help from demonic uh, forces. However, that being said, demons are very very active, and they're they're in the air and they're in uh, territories and. Uh, you know, Daniel talks about the, the prince of Persia that was assigned to this, and we know from Ephesians too that the demonic forces are are arranged sort of in, the, in a military um, uh, organizational structure where there's you know, there's captains and that type of thing where they're over one another. So demons are are at work in our world. Uh, they're influencing people, uh, whether or not biologically that's happening. Uh, I, I really couldn't say. Um, because scripture doesn't hint towards that, you know, towards the end times. Right. But what we do see in the end times is that we do see that the, that men will believe in doctrines of demons and fall away from the faith. Second uh, Timothy uh, three tells us, and and that they'll follow uh, cleverly devised schemes and and ways of being a. Uh, of thinking about truth and philosophy and that type of thing, uh, men will follow that. So in that sense, demons are luring people away uh, from the faith and into, and like you said earlier, they'll believe a lie and they'll say that the truth is not true. And mm-hmm. so that sort of deception is what Satan is, is a master at. He's the father of lies. No, I'm really glad you say that. Uh, you know, oftentimes Justin and I bring up the uh, idea or even the fact of mediumship and these people who can quote unquote contact the dead. And one of the things that I find funny myself, but also very similar between each and every medium, is they claim that they can determine when they contact something evil or when they're talking to something good. Mm-hmm. And they just don't quite understand or at least believe how deceptive Satan is and how long he's been playing this game. And I think I, I, I want to say, I want to go back to, uh, Oh, forgive me. I can't think of what book it is, but it's when Samuel goes to the witch of Endor and she contacts Mm -hmm. Samuel and she has a look of fear on her face when Samuel shows up. And now I know there's a lot of debate as to whether or not Samuel was really, you know, the spirit of Samuel and God, for some reason, allowed it at this time, or if it happened to be a demonic presence of some sort, I mean, we, we don't really know. Uh, we do know that there was truth spoken there. Um, but it's just interesting. Yeah, and yeah go ahead. Go ahead. I, I agree. You know, today, I mean, I think that um, Satan would want people to believe, obviously, that they're contacting dead relatives or, or that type of thing. And in fact, there was uh, um, in my neighborhood. I, I live in the capital city here, but uh, we sort of are in the midtown area. And 
the section of our little downtown area in this in this uh, section of town, some historic district. But at one time we had a um, a pagan shop in our area, and it was called the Broom Closet. Uh, first of all, I thought it was a cleaning supply store, but <laughs> found out it was actually a, a demonic uh, store. And they sold all types of uh, potions and literature and books and that type of thing. And so I would pick up their literature to see what it said. And um, one of the things that they were very strong in at this shop, uh, they were there to help people contact um, supernatural entities. Uh, they, they called them spirits. And they gave them a plan on how to contact the spirits, uh, how to establish a spirit connection with them, and even how to hear them speak to them uh, in their spirit. And this shop was there for years, and I went in there one day and was talking with the, the lady that was running the shop, and I, you know, and she had a British accent. So I found out that she had moved here from Britain to run this shop, and that she actually was under the authority of a bishop, she called him, that lived in another city in our state. And so there was an organizational structure, uh, even through disseminating the lies of Satan. And so all that to say is that, you know, yes, I, when people talk about supernatural experiences and, and speaking with demons, even seeing apparitions and those type of things, and obviously there's a certain amount of that, you know, that, that can be dismissed for many d- different reasons, but, but I believe there's truth there because Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, and he'll say anything just to get people's eyes off of the truth and the Bible and the things that Jesus Christ says and what he did for them. Mm-hmm. I want to get your opinion on something or, or your thoughts on something. And this is actually in regards to speaking in tongues. Now, Scripture obviously tells us that it is a gift. And personally, through a number of research that I did, and especially through school, I go to a Christian uh, university, and based on theology, it would appear almost as if speaking in tongues as it once was is almost disappeared from the earth and is no longer really a gift supplied and instead is maybe changed into the ability to uh, speak other languages with other native peoples, you know, of different countries and cultures. And yet I hear, and I have recently heard, I should say, of a Christian church that has somehow, some way started to teach people how to speak in tongues. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, that's going against this whole idea of what a gift is, because a gift is given freely to someone by the Spirit. Right. Uh, so right. teaching someone how to speak in tongues isn't necessarily what I would call a, a Christ-like thing, per se, and perhaps even has a bit of a demonic influence behind it. What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, and, and obviously we recognize there, there are many uh, traditions within greater Christendom Mm-hmm. that do believe in speaking in tongues and even practice what they call speaking in tongues. Obviously, we need to get our authority and our source from the Scripture itself. And when you study that whole scenario in Scripture, uh, the Greek word uh, for tongues there is the word glosa. And in the Greek language, it, uh, it, meant, uh, it meant one of two things. It either meant the tongue in your head, the physical tongue in your head, or to speak another language, another known language. So when you historically read the book of Acts, you see in Acts chapter 2 that suddenly the disciples, when the Holy Spirit came on them, they were able to speak in languages that were previously unlearned. Mm -hmm. However, unlike what the modern charismatic movement claims, those languages in the Bible were known languages. Right. Because you had you had Jews that had come from all over the known world uh, for like kind of a huge festival, the Feast of, of Pentecost, and they were there. They don't they didn't all speak the same language. So God gave those early believers the supernatural ability to speak in a language that they previously did not know for the purpose of showing the Jewish people that this was really a movement of God. Because consider that for thousands of years. The Jewish faith had been all the Jews had known. Now God says, I'm I'm done with the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. I'm doing a new thing here, and I know you're not going to believe it, so I'm going to do some supernatural things to convince you. So -hmm. that's what Paul talks about in in Acts, and you see it in 1 Corinthians. After 1 Corinthians, 
the gift of tongues is non-existent in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. So there's there's no record of, of it all. So from that, my personal belief is that the gift of tongues was a was a temporary gift to help establish the church as being authentic and supernatural and being from God. And he even says in First Corinthians twelve through fourteen that tongues are a sign for to unbelievers mm-hmm. that and to Jews. So there are always Jews present. So the idea of God launching the church off the ground and he wanted to, to give it a boost and so he accompanied it with all these supernatural signs. So I think a lot of the modern day tongues movement is um, there's a lot of emotionalism attached mm-hmm. to it. Uh, there's a lot of spiritual elitism attached to it, and where we really see people speaking in unlearned languages, like a static babbling, uh, we see that in pagan practices today, mm-hmm. down in Haiti, some places in Africa. Um, so I would say that that would not be something that uh, that I would put much stock in. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your view on that. Yeah, sure. All right, folks, we are speaking with Jeff Kinley. We are going to take another short break here and listen to Justin's Paranormal Headlines. So stay tuned, and we will be right back. And now, Paratruth Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Hey, Parafans. Justin here with your Paranormal Headlines. These headlines are from unexplainedmysteries.com. Island of Dolls is the stuff of nightmares. A remote area of woodland in Mexico is home to thousands of mutilated dolls hanging up in trees. The cold, dead stare of a doll's eyes have the potential to freak just about anyone out at the best of times. But for those with an actual phobia of dolls, there is one place you definitely don't want to visit. Situated in a remote wooded area in Xochimilco, Mexico, the appropriately named Island of the Dolls consists of thousands of old dolls and doll parts hanging ominously from the trees. Legend has it that artist Julian Santana Barrera, who is attributed with hanging up the first dolls, was compelled to do so after hearing the tormented screams of a girl said to have drowned nearby. Since then, the area has gained a reputation for being haunted and visitors continue to drop by from time to time to leave coins and to hang more dolls, thus adding to the ever-growing collection. New video shows dark side of the moon. NASA has released a unique video showing the dark side of the moon as it passes in front of the Earth. While just about everyone will have gone outside on a clear night to gaze up at the moon at least once during their lifetime, what can't be seen from the surface of the Earth is the side of the moon that faces away from us, the dark side that is permanently hidden from view. Now in an impressive new image sequence, NASA has revealed what the moon looks like from the other side as it passes over our planet thanks to the Deep Space Climate Observatory satellite a spacecraft that orbits at a distance of 1 million miles from the Earth. Using its Earth polychromatic imaging camera, the probe is designed to keep a watchful eye on our planet for the purpose of monitoring the climate and to help predict space weather. The first time the far side of the moon was viewed was in 1959 by Soviet spacecraft Luna 3. It is surprising how much brighter Earth is than the moon said NASA's Adam Szabo. Our planet is a truly brilliant object in dark space compared to the lunar surface. And this has been Justin with your Paranormal Headlines. This was a segment of Paratruth Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. And we are speaking with Jeff Kinley, who wrote the book, As It Was in the Days of Noah. Now, just before break, we were speaking about whether or not the gift of speaking in tongues still exists today. And if so, or if not, whether or not it's a you know something of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, I noticed as we were speaking this last segment here that we're starting to get a little bit away from the book. (laughs) So (laughs) with that said, I'm going to try and backtrack a bit here and get back into as it was in the days of Noah. And Jeff, one of the things that I've noticed growing up and and still very uh, big today, it's all these different Fisher Price toys that they have out, you know, for kids and all the storybooks that show a very kid friendly version of Noah. And one thing that I heard at my church a while a while ago now, probably about a year or so ago, was that if if we wanted to be truly accurate, we would sell these toys with you know, Noah and the family and all these happy animals, but we'd also give them a couple of toys that had X's on their eyes and animals with X's on their eyes and have them, you know, dead bodies and this and that and so on and so forth. And I think people today, uh, both kids especially, but also many adults just don't really fully understand what the flood was all about. And what kind of tragedy yeah. and horror uh, was probably seen at that time? The, the the type of screaming that there's probably the agony of mm-hmm. people drowning and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I mean, do you think that it's a good thing to keep it relatively kidly friendly, or do you think there's a line? No, yeah, no. yeah. I I think that personally that Noah would be very shocked to learn that his life's mission and message and hard work had been reduced to a playtime cartoon theme for children's ministries all over the world, you know, and, mm-hmm. and oh, look at, look at the giraffe sticking up out of the ark and that type of thing. And, um, but in reality, it's a story of evil and wrath and worldwide destruction. In fact, it's a horrific R-rated version in his mm-hmm. in moment in history where God obliterated everything that lived. Mm-hmm. And so, it, it really, I think, is a, is a story that that you want to be careful to tell children, right. um, just like other horrific judgments of God. And, and of course, you know, we, we think in our in our generation the closest thing we have, you know, to to um, uh, catastrophe is nine eleven, and we think about the horror of that day. And imagine that being a cartoon for someone to tell their children. And yeah. mm-hmm. and so, uh, so I think as we look at this, we need to understand that uh, God was very patient with the world. In fact. Uh, Noah spent 120 years building the ark, and that's a long time to get people to repent. And I talk about in the book, there's a very special meaning that Methuselah's name has that uh, has a, a relationship to the flood. But in the bottom line is that, that God just gave them a very long time to repent. But when they didn't, God said, okay, my patience has run out. And so he literally wiped off uh, man off the face of the earth. And so I do think it's um, a story that, that is a very sobering story. And I think that's one of the reasons why in bringing that story to the surface now, like raising it from the waters of history, it should be sobering today. But, but think about it. When you talk to people today about the relationship between the days of Noah and our day, the pandemic godlessness, the, the culture of violence that we're seeing, and we could talk more about that, unrestrained morality, things that are going on in our world, and people just, they just walk on, they go on their own merry way like nothing is happening. Mm-hmm. But that's exactly what Jesus said they would do, is right. that, it would, that destruction would suddenly come upon them. So, you know, there you kind of have the, these oh my God kind of moments in life, and, and it's going to be an oh my God moment, I believe, when when the Lord comes back, because these people uh, think that that we're nuts, just like they thought Noah was nuts for building the ark. Mm-hmm. I agree, and you know, and it, honestly, I, was, I think this often, actually, sometimes, and just the way the world is working nowadays, and just this conversation, and in a sense, it doesn't really, you know, make me scared to think, oh, you know, the world is going to be ending soon, and this and that. It actually gives me hope and confidence that. Mm-hmm what I believe is true because it's all right there in scripture. It's laid out in front of us that every single thing that's been happening was going to happen. You know, we were already told that. And what does make me sad is that people still don't see, even if I read it to them or I show them that, you know, this show like, eh, no, you know, it's, it's not real, but it is really quite sad. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely true. In fact, I I have, I tell the story in the book of the sinking of the Titanic and how, 
uh, people believed that it could never happen to the Titanic because she was unsinkable. And just mm-hmm. that human pride that comes into play when you start talking about things like the end of the world and Christ coming back and the rapture and, and the, the whole idea of there being global destruction coming down on the earth. And, and you just finally have to say, as a follower of Christ and, and as someone who reads the Bible, you just have to say, you know, Noah's story is our story. You know, right. we're living in a, a rebellious planet. There's a coming global storm. And yet, there's an open door of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And just like Noah had that open door for 120 years, I mean, we today, we're standing out in our world as, as Noah's saying, hey, there's hope, there's time, and it's not raining yet. So there's time to get on board with Jesus, who's the ark. Mm-hmm. Now, we are coming close to the end of the show here. But I want to get your thoughts on this. I know a lot of people, some of my own friends, you know, believe that the time in which Christ comes back and the time in which the earth, as mentioned in Scripture, will be destroyed by fire because God has already hung up his bow. He's already said that he will not flood the earth again with water, uh, but instead he'll destroy it with fire. But many of my friends and I think many other Christians out there truly believe that the end is going to come at some point within our generation, our lifetime. And, you know, I'm personally, I don't truly believe that based on what I see now and based on what the scriptures tell us the earth was like. Do you think based on what evil we see now in the world compared to what was there in Noah that, you know, the Lord coming back finally just, you know, ending it all, you know, just he's tired of it is upon us as in, you know, within the next few years or within the next generation. Or is this something you think is still a little bit down the line yet? And there's still a ways to go before the world, the world is that corrupted. Right. Well, there are things we know and there are things we don't know. Right. And the thing that we don't know is the timing of Christ's return to come in to, to snatch his bride up, to take her to heaven before he unleashes his wrath on the earth. Like he did know, he rescued Noah before wrath, he rescued Lot before wrath, mm-hmm. uh, he rescued Rahab, who was a believer, and yet the destruction was around her. Uh, so we don't know the time, we really don't. And, and the other thing we don't know is, we don't know how long suffering God really is. I mean, mm-hmm. it says in Second Peter 1 that the Lord is, is patient toward man. His long-suffering is, is, is very, um, it's very powerful. So I underestimate God's patience many times. I underestimate his love and even his patience for me. Um, <laughs> but that's what we don't know. We don't know how long his patience is or the timing. Here's what we do know. We do know that, that we are gradually ramping up to uh, that time and that we are in fact first john says that, that they were in the last days in the first century so we've been in the last days since the first century we've just not hit the actual end times yet right uh however i do believe that we are uh obviously closer than it than we've ever been before and here's why when we look at uh, evil in context of a completed and full revelation uh, in the Bible, we see that the planet, as it, as it is right now, has not been this decadent since the days of Noah. The other thing that's really interesting is that uh, there are more Jews living in Israel right now today on the earth than at any time since the first century. So in 20 centuries, Jews have not been in the Holy Land. The fact that Ezekiel 38 predicts that Israel would be taken back to the land before the end times, and that they're actually there now, uh, is pretty amazing to me. Mm-hmm. Um, as we read the book of Revelation, those things have to happen in order for the end to come. So Israel is in place. There's an emerging one-world government with the European uh, Economic Union. Whether whether it actually is going to be that the Antichrist leads or not, at least those kinds of things are in place. Countries right now are so leaning on one another with Greece and Spain and, and Italy and all these countries that are on the verge of economic collapse. We're going to have to have a one world government for us to survive. Uh, just like the first century and just like the end times are predicted, there will be increasing hostility and persecution towards Christians, less moral absolutes, mainstream acceptance uh, of immorality. So here's the deal. It, it's not that there is a, it's not that it's storming right now, but there are storm clouds on the horizon. Mm-hmm. And we don't know how fast they're going to come or how slow they're going to come. 
but but we're, it's lighter than it's ever been before. So I'm you know I'm very specific in the book about not saying that this is the last generation or that you know we're going to see the, the return of Christ uh, before we die or whatever. However, it would not surprise me. It's just that I don't have God's timetable, and so He's the one that decides. Okay, that was it, you know. And um, and I and yet I look at things like what our Supreme Court has just done, and I just go, here we are at the highest levels of our government, and we have a Supreme Court who is legitimizing something that the Bible calls an abomination. Uh, we have a president who's jumping up and down and hugging people in his office when the decision is made. He's lighting up the White House with the quote-unquote gay flag, that type of thing. And I just go, well, it's never been like this before. Uh, So how much worse does it need to get? I don't know. I just know that it's bad, but I also know that God still loves people. Mm -hmm. I know that Jesus is the ark. He's still the answer, and that anyone can call on him, and their sins will be forgiven. They'll find refuge in him. And I know that the same God that floods also forgives and so that's the hope that, that I want people to know through this book is that although it may be dark, that's when the light shines the brightest. Well, thank you for that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. Now, unfortunately, we are at the end of the show, and I'd like to give you a moment and the opportunity to tell people where they could find your book, where they can contact you or find your, your, your website if you have one. Absolutely, yeah. My website is jeffkinley.com, J-E-F-F-K-I-N-L-E-Y.com. And there's lots of information about my ministry and my speaking ministry and other books that I've written. Uh, the As It Was in the Days of Noah can be bought in any book outlet, uh, anywhere online. There, It's everywhere, all the airports across the country. I see it as I fly in. I'll see my book there. and So it's everywhere. Um, and, uh, yeah, they can contact me if they want to. Just uh, go to my website. There's a place where you can send me an email. And I'd love to answer any questions or uh, respond to any comments. Great. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for being on. We really enjoyed uh, having you with us. Absolutely. Well, Justin and Eric, it's it's a pleasure and a privilege to to be with you tonight. I wish God's very, very best for you guys and your life and ministry. Same thing. Thank you, sir. Likewise. All right. Have a good night. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, folks, that was Jeff Kidley, the author of As It Was in the Days of Noah. Very humble man, very knowledgeable in everything we spoke about. Uh, he knows the scriptures very well. It's very obvious. I love his, his answers. Absolutely. He's done great research. Uh, you know, and the one thing that I really like, because I know, Justin, you and I both hear this, uh, not only with some guests on our show, but it, more in particular in other shows, other shows that we listen to uh, within the paranormal community, it, people always have some kind of definitive answer. You know, they're always like, oh, yes, God is going to be here before our time is up. I'm sure of it. Right. Or, you know, no, it's not going to happen. It's rare that we come across someone who actually leaves it up in the air because he just we don't really know. The Bible doesn't tell us. The scripture says that the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. You know? Yeah, nobody it, knows and people think they do. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where that pride comes from, but unfortunately, that's one of the fall that's that's the fall of Satan, you know, and that's unfortunately the fall of many of us, myself included. You know. Uh, pride just happens to get to us and we think we know better or know best. But unfortunately, and fortunately as well, we don't know. And God has made that perfectly clear and there's a reason for that it's because he wants everyone to come to faith with a true heart he wants people who are going to turn to him who really love him who really want to choose him not people who are suddenly scared because it's the last minute and oh i don't want to go to hell you know i'm just gonna say i like god you know i love god (laughs) and and you know there's gonna be people who do that probably there might be people who do it now but if it's not sincere he knows he'll know he, scripture tells us, the scripture tells us that he knows our hearts. He knows every thought we have. He'll know whether or not you're being sincere enough that you really truly love God, that you love him, or if you're just saying it out of fear and want desperately for, you know, some kind of hope to hold on to, even if you're just lightly grasping it, you don't really care, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh. All right, folks, that is all we have for Jeff Kinley's book. We are going to go into uh, a scripture time really fast with Eric, and then we have 
a few real quick announcements before we mm-hmm. end out the evening. Absolutely. So I'm not going to get into I, I know I said this last time, too. I'm not going to get into it too much because uh, I do tend to talk a lot sometimes. A lot. A lot. <laughs> you know what? That's enough from you. Uh, <laughs> but, I, you know, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Truthfully, I think the few scriptures that I chose for today in regards to, especially in regards to this topic that we that we discussed today with Jeff, I think it speaks for itself. And so I'm lit- literally going to go through two passages here and not comment on it whatsoever. He did bring that, up a lot during during the interview, too. So there's a lot to think about, guys. There is. There is. So this first one comes from 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. And it says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the adulterers, nor the adulterers, nor people who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Then in 2 Timothy 3, 1-5, through it says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, Swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And the scriptures tell us very clearly to avoid such people. You know, it's very interesting because when you look at the way the days are today, and I know not everyone sees this, but if you look clearly, you will see all these things happening right now. You will see these lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having the appearance of godliness. You look at Jenner, for example, with the sex change. How, I'm going to say he, because I truly believe that the way God created you is the way you are regardless of what you do to yourself. He is seen as some kind of God in a sense. How many of actors, how many musicians, how many, look, look at our presidents, you know, and, and the powers around the world. People look up to them in such a way that they praise them. They worship them. You know, and, and in regards to you know, the immoral, the idolaters, the idolaters, and yes, I know I mentioned people who practice homosexuality. I know how offensive that sounds. I, I do. Don't get me wrong. And do I agree with, you know, homosexuality as the rest of America does? Absolutely not. I, I don't agree with it whatsoever. I think it's wrong and it's sinful. That's what the scriptures say and that's what God thinks. He hates it. Does that me, make you any less of a person? Does that make you any less better than me? No. Because I'm not better than you. I'm not. And I know that. And you know what? And I'm learning that day by day and it's something that I've struggled with personally acceptance you know accepting others if you will yeah and it's it's hard to see things sometimes too uh, I kind of debate back and forth a lot because I see certain things happening and it's like god is things actually lining up or is it just my imagination i don't know right so. well and you know and it's it's crazy you know it really is and it's dark it is obviously dark i don't think it's as dark as the days of noah but it's dark but there is hope and of course i have two more scriptures because i'm not going to just leave you with this sad almost hopeless type of scripture <laughs> that leaves you depressed but instead i'm going to move into john three sixteen. And 17 and also John 8 11 in John 3 16 17 it says for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life 
For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. What this scripture is telling us is that no matter your sin, no matter what you do or what you think or how you are, God loves you. And if you're willing to accept him for who he is, you're willing to believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth, died on the cross for your sin, and rose again so that you may have salvation through him and live in paradise for eternity with him and never suffer after this world passes away. You have that opportunity. If you turn to him, you will be saved. There is a condition. There's always a condition. And it's a difficult one. And God has plenty of grace and mercy. But according to John 8, 3, or 8, 11, I'm sorry, John 8, 11, Jesus, speaking to a woman who is beaten and thrown to the ground, wanted, these men wanted to kill her because she was an adulterer. Jesus walked up to her and he looked at the men and said, if any of you are sinless, cast the first stone and kill her. And they couldn't do it because every single one of them knew that they were sinful. Each one had committed sin. And Jesus looked at her and said, Does no one convict you for this? And she said, No, man. No one does. And Jesus said, Then neither do I condemn you. And here's the condition. Go and sin no more. It's difficult. It's difficult to stay away from sin because our hearts, our minds, want nothing but sin. We're corrupted. From the day we are born, we're corrupted due to the fall of Adam and Eve. But because of God's grace and his mercy, if we truly believe in him, truly believe that Jesus is Lord and we love him and trust him and we put our lives in his hands, he's quick to forgive us. It's just something I want to leave everyone with tonight. All right. All right, folks, a uh, few quick announcements before we head out. Uh, if you guys didn't catch it, we have our first S-Files episode up and running. Whoop-a-boo! And uh, I was actually very proud of that because we did a did something that uh, we had debated about for a while. So uh, definitely check that out. Yeah. And uh, also, too, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, and you know what? We a lot of you have been tuning into the S files too. Uh, you know we notice wh- how many listeners we get, and a lot of you have been checking it out, and that's what I think what makes us kind of so proud. <laughs> yeah. Because this is something we have been debating, and the fact that you guys uh, and when I say guys, I mean the ladies too. So <laughs> you guys and ladies, <laughs> mm-hmm. you people. <laughs> you p- what do you mean you people? <laughs> no, no, I mean I don't. I don't mean you people. I mean you people. Oh, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, now you made me lose my track. Uh, anyway, we are very thankful that everyone who has tuned into that show, The S Files, uh, we're very thankful that you guys all tuned in, period. And we hope that you guys liked it enough that you're willing to hear another one. We've got another one, I think, in about th- uh, three weeks or so. We're going to do another episode yeah, uh, of the S Files. So if you enjoyed it and you're willing, feel free to email us, paratruthradio at gmail.com. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, well, uh, and we have so many files to go through. I really hope that you guys uh, do uh, like the S Files. So. We have a lot of files to go through. Yeah. So, um, well, and. Uh, on top of that, too, we do have our new logo out. So go ahead, email us about that as well, what you guys think of it. Do mm-hmm. you like it? Do you dislike it? Is there something you do like that, and something that you don't that needs hey. just to be changed? Do you like the logo and not like us? <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> you can also uh, go to our website, paratruthradio.com, and on the Listen Live tab, we do have a chat room. We also have a comment box underneath that if you want to leave us comments there. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and uh, as always, 
Spreaker as well. You can mm-hmm. leave us any comments you want, good, bad, indifferent. We need to know how we're doing, guys. So I, I Absolutely. do uh, encourage you guys to uh, get us those that feedback. And lastly, uh, Eric has been giving some revealed updates. I know it's getting close, so we don't want to give too many more updates. But uh, why don't you give them one final update before before film time <clears throat> one final update well <clears throat> i'm sure i'll give you a couple more in the future as we get closer but the only real update that i have right now is a special thanks update <laughs> oh that's it be- there's a reason because you know right now since last week there's not much progression with the film within a week sometimes it takes a little time uh I, there's a lot of stuff i can't do until i get back down to virginia next week yeah and that's when things are going to start flying we're going to start getting things in order um so the one thing that i do want to do though that i do want to do yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> i love how just, you always have to reward yourself i always, always got to do it uh i just want to give a quick shout out Again, I'm not going to mention names just because there's a lot of names and uh, I don't even know if they listen to the show, to be honest. (laughs) But I I do want to give a special thanks to four people who gave me a combined donation of one hundred and twenty dollars today for the revealed. That's super awesome. You guys are amazing. You already know it. I thank you like a billion times (laughs) uh, when you gave me the money. So I truly appreciate it. Folks, all money that is received as a donation to the revealed is going towards the revealed 100 percent hands down. So if you're interested in donating to this movie, to this great cause uh, that that is really going to think, I think, shed some light on this whole alien conspiracy in, in particular. For those of you who are interested in the alien conspiracy thing, feel free to check out Facebook.com forward slash the revealed movie. There you will find some recent posts of the GoFundMe page where you can uh, donate the money. There is a possibility of me starting an Indiegogo page coming up. Don't worry, I'm not going to have two campaigns going at one time. I'll end up deleting one. There's a reason for that. And the reason is there's more perks with the Indiegogo, to be honest. Uh, It's a little easier for people to manage, for for, uh, people to donate. Uh, GoFundMe, unfortunately, their search engine isn't as good uh, as I would like it to be. But yeah, so if you're interested, please check out the GoFundMe page on facebook.com forward slash the revealed movie. Also, you can go to paratruthradio.com, click on the creative links tab, you can see the synopsis of my movie and there's a GoFundMe link at the bottom if you'd like to contribute. Any questions you have regarding the movie, feel free to contact us again at paratruthradio uh, at gmail.com. I'd be happy to talk with you about it. Uh, and I think that's about it, all I have for this week. Oh, um, right. I think the very final thing, well, on, in regards to that, <laughs> but the very final thing is because I know Justin and I we, we've been doing this recently if anyone out there is experiencing any type of demonic affliction or oppression and you need help you need someone to talk to someone who's been through it someone who's witnessed it someone who has fought the battles feel free to contact us again I'm, this is the third time fourth time we're putting this out there paratruthradio at gmail.com we'd be happy to talk with you about it we'd be happy to fight the battle along with you. So uh, I think that's it then, right? Do you got anything? Uh, Just real fast. Next week, guys, we're going to be talking about Echidna, which is from Greek mythology. And we will also be following that show with uh, Bill Hall returning to Paratruth Radio to talk to us about his new book. So uh, stay tuned for all those great things coming. That is some awesome sauce, man. Yep. With that said, folks, my name, as always, is Eric. I'm Justin. And this was Paratruth Radio. So until next time, peace. If you enjoyed this episode of Paratruth Radio and you would like to listen to it again or are interested in listening to any of our past episodes, then you can listen to them on HD at our website, paratruthradio.com. And you can also find us at Stitcher, Blueberry, TuneIn, iTunes, Spreaker, and YouTube. 
And of course, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for brand new updates of our show every day.